Notice. The author's contract with Audible permits a sample no longer than 10% of the audiobook's length to be uploaded to YouTube. This is therefore only an extended sample from which this channel makes no money. The idea is to give listeners a longer time than the five minutes of audio sample to decide if the narration and the story are for them. We do hope you find that they are. Chapter 1. Library. Pemberley. Friday, 7th August, 1812. Fitzwilliam Darcy stepped out of the library into the wide main hall and just as hastily ducked back in at the sound of two female voices approaching from his right. He knew those voices, knew them all too well, and had absolutely no desire to speak even pleasantries with Mrs. Louisa Hurst and Miss Caroline Bingley, both of them unwanted guests at Pemberley. He had invited them, of course, as no one stayed at Pemberley without his exclusive invitation, but the presence of the Bingleys and Hursts was most inconvenient, given that Darcy had, only three days previously, unexpectedly encountered the love of his life, Miss Elizabeth Bennet of Longbourn. Darcy shut the library door carefully and wandered over to stare out the window. He was master of Pemberley, a grand estate with a yet grander home, and he took a moment to really gaze at it, to think about its many glories. Glittering sunlight drew his eye to the large, graceful pond some short way from the house, fed by a trout stream that vanished off into the forested park. Some small creature peered out from a bush before vanishing again in a whisk of grey fur. The trees were heavy with their crown of deep green leaves, the grass and shrubs spotted with dabs of colourful flowers blooming and shivering in the slight breeze. He was blessed, he knew. Pemberley was large and thriving and bounteous, and Darcy had little concern for the future. But his estate's magnificence came at a price. His position as master of the estate required a great deal of hard work, he spent many hours a day dealing with business and estate concerns and thinking about the needs and problems of his tenants. Perhaps Mr. Darcy is in the library, Miss Bingley's strident voice exclaimed from just outside the door. Darcy jerked in surprise and distress, and he looked around as if he were a hare attempting to hide from the hounds. He did not want to speak with Miss Bingley on the best of days, but today, with his mind entirely on Elizabeth Bennet, he most certainly did not. He hurriedly made his way into a small alcove in the corner of the room, and, inspired by panic, raised the window to its full height and rolled himself out of the library and into the bushes directly beyond the window. For a minute he merely lay there, panting, even as he heard Miss Bingley and Mrs. Hurst enter the room behind him. Mr. Darcy, Miss Bingley cried out in an arch tone. Mr. Darcy, are you here? A moment passed, and Darcy found himself thinking with horror how incredibly foolish he would appear if Miss Bingley happened to pop her head out the window above his hiding place. He's not here, the same lady said in a disappointed tone. We've checked the other obvious places. Where can he be? Mr. Darcy has a great deal of business, Mrs. Hurst replied soothingly. Perhaps he is speaking to a steward or something of the sort. He could be. Oh, Louisa, I do hope Mr. Darcy offers for me during our visit here. Just think how much I could help in managing the estate if I were Mrs. Darcy. Darcy, cowering under his bush, cringed at these words. He would never, under any circumstances, offer for Miss Bingley. Given that he is not here, perhaps we should practice our duet on the pianoforte, Mrs. Hurst suggested. Oh, yes, that is a wonderful idea. Your voice is far better than Miss Eliza Bennet's, and I play far better than she does too. A moment later, Darcy heard the welcome sound of retreating feet. Once he was certain that he was safe from being seen, Darcy made his stealthy way along the bushes in the direction of the stables. He would take his favourite stallion, Phoenix, into Lambton now, and he hoped would have the opportunity to speak with the lady he adored.
Phoenix was familiar with the path to Lambton, and thus Darcy was not required to pay much attention to guiding the horse. That was for the best, as his mind was whirling over his complex relationship with Elizabeth Bennet. He was, as nephew of an earl, as master of a great estate with an income of £10,000 a year, a most eligible bachelor. For many years he had been seeking an appropriate wife. Regrettably, he had so far been entirely unsuccessful, largely because he did not want an attractive ornament on his arm, but a loving, capable wife at his side. He longed to wed an intelligent lady who would assume the traditional responsibilities of the mistress of the estate, who would care for the tenants and the house and their own children. For many years he had gone in search of precisely such a woman, attending balls and Venetian breakfasts and small family dinner parties in London. Unfortunately, the society ladies had universally bored him, despite their wealth and high position and abundant accomplishments. It was not until he travelled to Hertfordshire to stay with his friend Charles Bingley that he had met a lady whom he found genuinely fascinating. Miss Elizabeth Bennet, the second of five daughters, was the child of a lazy gentleman and a shrill solicitor's daughter, without any sort of a dowry, with pert manners and fine eyes, in a remarkably pretty face. She had captured him utterly. She was lively and lovely and graceful and intelligent, and had no qualms at all about debating with him on any subject— Darcy had not at all intended to fall in love with her, cheerful arguments notwithstanding. Her connections were execrable, her lack of wealth deplorable, her status unacceptable. He had ignored his own heartache when he had departed from Hertfordshire in late November, telling himself that it was all for the best, that his strange infatuation with the lady would soon pass. And perhaps it had briefly gone to rest, but had flared back stronger than ever when he had, most unexpectedly, encountered Miss Elizabeth in Kent when he went to visit his aunt, Lady Catherine de Bourgh, mistress of the great estate of Rosings. The memory of first seeing her rose now in Darcy's mind as strongly as if it had been but yesterday. She had been out on a walk, her straw bonnet decorated only with a white ribbon, her dress a delicate green which had flattered her complexion and chestnut hair. He had reined in his horse, watching in stunned amazement all his old admiration rising like a venerable, billowing dragon from its resting place. She had not spotted him, and he had forced himself to ride on. He had learned from his aunt that Miss Bennet was visiting the local rector and his wife, Mr. and Mrs. Collins, and that very day he had visited the parsonage with his cousin, Colonel Fitzwilliam, who had come down from town with him. Elizabeth was just as enchanting as he remembered, and he realised that the magnetic attraction he felt for her was still as strong as ever. For two full weeks Darcy had battled his adoration to the lady before giving in to his passionate desire to make her his wife. He had called upon her at the parsonage one evening when the Collinses were at dinner with Lady Catherine and Miss Bennet had stayed behind with a headache. He had found the lady alone and promptly offered his hand in marriage. Thinking of his proposal still made him wince. It had, he acknowledged, been very poorly done on his part. It could not by any stretch be considered diplomatic to insult the relations and the standing of the lady to whom one was proposing, and yet that was exactly what he had done. Miss Bennet had been rightfully furious, and still he had been stunned beneath the weight of her full disapproval. It had never so much as dawned on him that Elizabeth, with no dowry and poor connections, would refuse him. She had thoroughly dressed him down for his ungentlemanly conduct in his proposal, those fine brown eyes flashing, before accusing him sharply of orchestrating her sister's broken heart. He had listened in astonishment as she told him of her gentle sister's deep and abiding love for Charles Bingley, who at Darcy's suggestion had abandoned the eldest Miss Bennet the previous autumn. 
but it was her spirited defence of the utter reprobate George Wickham that had sent him away with boiling blood and confusion in his heart. Darcy would fully admit now how poorly done his proposal was, along with his own culpability in Bingley's abandonment of Miss Bennet, but there was no viable argument in favour of Wickham. He had taken his heartbroken leave of her in the parsonage, and then written a letter in his own defence, which he had handed over to her the next day, before hurrying back to London with a broken and battered heart. He had thought to never see her again, and so it had been like a lightning strike across his soul some three days previously when he encountered Elizabeth Bennet standing outside his home of Pemberley upon his arrival from London. She had been openly uncomfortable, as she explained that she and her aunt and uncle were on a tour of Derbyshire and had just toured the mansion with Mrs. Reynolds, Darcy's housekeeper. At his request, she had then introduced him to her tradesman uncle and his wife, who were genteel and refined. Eventually, the three visitors had made their way to a carriage and vanished down the road without a backward glance, leaving Darcy to watch with a wildly beating heart and a spark of hope that perhaps, perhaps, he and Miss Bennet would be able to be friends. Or more. Darcy was determined to offer that road and the house and the land to go with it to Elizabeth once more. He would do better this time. Today, he decided, was his chance. He might well never see Miss Bennet again once she journeyed onward from Derbyshire. He would act now, he would tell her how ardently he loved and admired her, how enduring his passion was. He was not blind or cocky, he knew that she might refuse him another time. He had braced himself for such a possibility. But whatever her answer, he was confident that he had matured since the time when he had first met her, and that was something. But he hoped and prayed and longed for so much more. He longed to make Elizabeth his wife. The Inn, Lambton. Darcy swung easily out of the saddle and handed the reins over to a stable boy who was all eager wonder at being permitted to look after the magnificent black stallion, if only for a little while. I will be back in perhaps an hour, Darcy said, handing over two coins. Take good care of him. I will, sir, the boy said in awe, and Darcy watched with a critical eye as the young man led the great beast into the stable, attached to the inn. It was obvious that the boy was skilled at handling horses, and Darcy relaxed and hurried into the inn, where a servant met him, and upon being told of Darcy's desired destination, guided him up the stairs and to the door, which led to the parlour currently being rented by Mr. Gardiner. The servant opened the entrance, and Darcy stepped forward into the room, only to halt in amazement at the sight of Elizabeth, dressed in a simple blue muslin gown, hurrying toward the door, her face pale, her manner tumultuous. "'I beg your pardon, but I must leave you,' she cried out. "'I must find Mr. Gardner this moment on business that cannot be delayed. I have not an instant to lose.' "'Good God, what is the matter?' he exclaimed, and then, pulling himself together, said, I will not detain you a minute, but let me or the servant go after Mr. and Mrs. Gardner. You are not sufficiently well. You cannot go yourself. She wobbled in place, and Darcy stepped forward close enough to catch her if she fainted, which seemed possible. You are correct, she finally managed, and hurried past him into the corridor, where he could hear her directing the man to find Mr. and Mrs. Gardner and bring them as quickly as possible to the inn. Darcy was relieved to see her looking slightly more steady when she returned, though still entirely miserable in her demeanour, and he said, Let me call your maid. Is there nothing you could take to give you present relief? Shall I pour you a glass of wine, perhaps? You are very ill. No, I thank you, she replied, collapsing onto a nearby chair, her handkerchief in her hand. There is nothing the matter with me. I'm quite well. I'm only distressed by some dreadful news which I've just gotten word from Longbourn. She burst into tears as she alluded to it, and for a few minutes could not speak another word. Darcy watched her with horrified distress.
Such grief spoke of death, perhaps of one of her parents or one of her sisters. He could still remember the pain of losing his own parents, and his heart broke that she might have received similar information. I have just had a letter from Jane with such horrible news, she finally choked out. It cannot be concealed from anyone. My youngest sister has left all her friends, has eloped. She has thrown herself into the power of... of Mr. Wickham. They have gone off together from Brighton. You know him too well to doubt the rest. She has no money, no connections, nothing but contempt him to... She is lost forever. Darcy jolted in astonished horror. What? Lydia! Lydia has run off with Wickham, she repeated. Oh, I was such a fool. I knew what he was. I knew he was a reprobate, but it did not occur to me. I did not imagine that he would have any interest in my youngest sister. I should have said something. It is my fault. Darcy felt an almost overwhelming desire to pull her into his arms and kiss away her tears. But that was not the action of an honourable man. No. What Elizabeth needed was actual assistance in this family tragedy. I will find them, he said flatly, and deal with the matter as best I can. This provoked a look of astonishment, along with, he thought, a glimmer of hope. You? she asked a moment later. Oh, no, sir, it is not your problem. It is my problem, he exclaimed. Because I love you, and I always will, and if I had done what I should have in dealing with that scoundrel, this never would have happened. It is not your fault, Elizabeth cried out. It is my father's and my mother's and Lydia's and Wickham's and, yes, even mine. It has nothing to do with you. Moreover, I would not have you sharing our shame in any way. Miss Bennet. She looked up at him, her eyes red, her cheeks mottled in her distress, and yet he had never loved her so much as in this time of weakness. Yes? she asked shakily. My own sister agreed to run away with Wickham, he pointed out gently. Elizabeth swallowed convulsively and whispered, He would have married Miss Darcy if he had succeeded in running away with her. Because of her dowry, yes, that is true. But your sister and mine both made terrible mistakes where George Wickham was concerned. I will not step aside and leave you to settle this alone. I have long known Wickham to be dangerous, but my own foolish pride and my fear for Georgiana's reputation kept me silent. No more, Miss Bennet. No more. I will find them, and I will deal with Wickham, and I will make this right. How can you? she asked, and the despair in her voice made his heart twist in agony. The only solution to save us from ruin is for them to be married, and yet Wickham will refuse. Surely he will refuse, given that my father is not wealthy enough to provide much to support them. Darcy considered this for a long moment, and finally said, Do I have your permission to speak to Colonel Fitzwilliam on this matter? He is even more eager than I am to punish Wickham after what he did to Georgiana. I am certain there is a way to save your family's reputation without tying your youngest sister to Wickham forever, a fate I would wish on no woman. Elizabeth blinked hard and managed a wavering smile. She will not understand that, you know. To her, Wickham must seem like the most wonderful of possible husbands in all the world. He's both handsome and charming. Yes, and he is a profligate and a gambler and he will not be faithful to her. Perhaps we will need to arrange for a marriage between them, but if it can be avoided. My dear Miss Bennet, he will be the worst possible husband to Miss Lydia, and while you are undoubtedly angry with her, she is very young to be shackled to such a horrendous man. That is true enough, Elizabeth said miserably. But if they do not marry, we will be ruined, all of us. Not in my eyes, Darcy said gravely. Never in my eyes. I will not importune you during such a ghastly time, but be assured of my love, my respect, and my friendship for ever going forward, regardless of what happens. Elizabeth rose to her feet, and he was relieved to see that the deep, 
despondency, had retreated. While she was still solemn, she no longer appeared completely without hope. I thank you so much for your kindness, she said softly, and held out her hands towards him. When I think what a fool I was in Kent. You were not, Darcy said sternly. I behaved very poorly from the moment we first met in Meryton through our time in Kent, and the door opened at this juncture, and Mr. and Mrs. Gardner hurried in, both looking worried. Mr. Gardner, Mrs. Gardner, Darcy said, bowing, I will leave Miss Bennet to explain the situation. I will be journeying to London to assist in this matter as quickly as possible. The gardeners looked bewildered at these words, but did not protest as he departed. He would need to speak to Georgiana, and perhaps Bingley, and then make his hasty way to London. It was time to deal with Wickham once and for all, and, if he was very fortunate, he would win the lady he adored. Chapter 2 Darcy's Office, Pemberley An Hour Later the windows behind the desk cast ample light across the polished oak surface, the sunlight glaring off the pale paper lined up in neat stacks. The pen box sat open, the pen knife neatly put away, and the inkstand uncapped for frequent dipping. Darcy's hand darted over the single page laid out before him, neat black script flowing from his pen. Darcy? The master of Pemberley looked up to discover his close friend, Charles Bingley, hovering near the door, looking uncertain. Bingley, Darcy said, please come in, shut the door and sit down. The younger man obediently did so, and once the two men were both seated, there was a long pause as Darcy wondered what exactly to say. He was privy to a great deal of information about the Bennets, and while he trusted Bingley, he did not at all trust the man's sisters. I need to go to London to deal with a problem, he said abruptly. Oh, I am sorry, Darcy, that sounds serious. I hope no one in your family is ill. No, Darcy said, and after a moment of hesitation, continued, I am hesitant to speak about private matters, but it has to do with the Bennet family. Charles Bingley's eyes widened in distress. The Bennets? Is it... Is Miss Bennet unwell? Darcy sighed and shook his head. On the one hand, he felt an urgency to depart for London as quickly as possible, but in truth an hour did not truly matter. It was obvious that Bingley's heart still belonged to the blonde eldest daughter of Longbourn, and this conversation had been delayed too long. No, he said, and rose to his feet to wander over and stare outside at the flower garden which spread out beyond the window. A moment later, he turned and gazed directly into his friend's eyes. Bingley, I wish to tell you something, but I must beg that you avoid speaking of it to your sisters, or indeed anyone else. I will be completely silent, Bingley promised. Darcy returned to his desk and sat back down rather heavily. I mentioned that I met Miss Elizabeth Bennet while visiting my aunt, Lady Catherine de Bourgh, at Rosings this spring. You mentioned that, yes, Bingley replied. Darcy's gaze lowered to the stack of papers in front of him, and he said, I was strongly attracted to Miss Elizabeth during my stint at Netherfield, and... After a few weeks of spending time with her in Kent, I acknowledged that I adored her with all my heart, and I made her an offer of marriage. What? His friend's cry was full of such astonishment that Darcy could not help but lift his gaze to observe Bingley's wide eyes and flushed face. I made an offer of marriage, Darcy repeated, and she refused me. What? Bingley repeated and tilted his head as if the world had suddenly turned upside down. Miss Elizabeth refused you? Master of Pemberley, nephew of an earl? Why? Because she loathed me, and quite right she was. My offer was filled with insults about her family's poor behaviour and lack of connections, 
and I was consumed by pride and arrogance. I was totally taken aback when she rejected my offer, and harshly, but I deserved it. You do not deserve it. Indeed, as much as I admire Miss Elizabeth, I can only feel it was very peculiar and regrettable that she did not accept your offer. You are an honourable man and truly my best friend. Darcy swallowed hard and heaved out a breath. You may not feel the same when you hear that I was instrumental in separating you from Miss Jane Bennet. The flush in Bingley's cheeks drained away at these words, to be replaced by pallor. What do you mean, Darcy? One of the reasons Miss Elizabeth rejected me was that she heard that I had convinced you to leave Miss Bennet behind in Hertfordshire. She informed me that Miss Bennet cared for you deeply and was heartbroken when you left and did not return. Bingley actually wobbled slightly in place and looked down at his own hands. Do you think... Do you believe she was telling the truth about Miss Bennet? Without a doubt, Darcy said and chuckled ruefully. If there is one thing that I know about Miss Elizabeth, it is that she is truthful and does not prevaricate. I was entirely incorrect about Miss Bennet's feelings. She is a gentle and quiet person, and I misread her serenity for indifference. I was wrong. Bingley groaned aloud and looked up. It is not right for Miss Elizabeth to blame you, Darcy. I could and should have ignored your advice regarding Miss Bennet. I also concealed from you that Jane Bennet was in London for several months at the beginning of the year. Darcy continued, determined to make a clean breast of the matter. She visited Miss Bingley, who took several weeks to return the call, and when your sister did return the call, she made it clear through her words and demeanour that her friendship with Miss Bennet was at an end. Now Bingley's face was purple. You! My sister! How could you? Darcy shook his head. I was an idiot and a fool, Bingley, that is how. I made assumptions about Miss Bennet's attachment to you, and because of her family's situation in life and the poor behaviour of the younger Bennet girls, I decided that she was not worthy of you. Of course, I then realised that I was madly in love with Miss Elizabeth when I saw her again in Kent, which is one of the great ironies of life. My arrogant interference in your courtship of Miss Bennet resulted in the greatest disappointment of my life. Bingley was still looking angry, but he was at heart a kind soul, and he said, I am sorry, Darcy. I find it surprising that Miss Elizabeth refused you because of Miss Bennet. But then again, perhaps I'm not. The sisters are very close. There were other reasons. One was my pompous, arrogant, asinine behaviour. The other had to do with George Wickham, and he is the reason that I must rush to London. Wickham? I know that you and he are on poor terms, but I never heard details. He is a rake and a reprobate, and most regrettably he convinced the youngest Miss Bennet, Lydia, to run off with him from Brighton only a few days ago. He doubtless promised her marriage, but Miss Elizabeth is under no delusions. Wickham will only marry an heiress, and the Bennet daughters, as you know, are not well dowered. Thus the entire family is facing disaster, and I am painfully aware that if I had dealt with Wickham when I should have, this would never have happened. Bingley stared at him in horror. Miss Lydia has run away with a man who will not marry her? Not without a significant bribe, no. I intend to travel to London as soon as I can and solve this situation in some way. It is the least I can do, given that I knew what Wickham was and remained silent while in Hertfordshire. Is there anything I can do to assist? Bingley asked simply. Darcy smiled, even as he felt his chest relax. He knew that Bingley was angry with him, but his friend had always been a forgiving sort who easily set aside outrage in favour of being helpful. Darcy, regrettably, had quite an opposite sort of character and clung to his prejudices and ill temper, along with finding it nigh impossible to forgive others for their faults.
I do not believe there is anything you can help with in London, Darcy said. As to other matters, well, that is very much up to you. I know you cared deeply for Miss Bennet last autumn, but now... I never stopped loving her, Bingley interrupted and sighed sadly. I am at fault in this matter. I should have listened to my own heart instead of to you and my sisters. I was confident that she cared about me, and I let you sway me into believing I was wrong. Darcy did not know what to say to this, so he remained silent for a moment, as his friend cogitated. In any case, Bingley finally said, lifting his chin and straightening his shoulders. I would like to help in some way. Perhaps I could return to Netherfield and stand as a friend to the family in the midst of their difficulties. That would be most kind, Darcy said hesitantly, and then turned to gaze directly into his friend's blue eyes. You realise, I hope, that if Miss Lydia is not safely wed in short order, the other Bennet daughters will be tainted by her actions, including the lady you love. I do not care about that. Bingley replied immediately, so long as she truly loves me. Indeed, after Caroline and Louisa's actions, and my own, she may never wish to see me again, in which case I shall withdraw from the field. But I know that Miss Bennet is a virtuous and honourable woman, and I would be privileged to make her my wife. Perhaps that sounds absurd, but that is how I feel. It is not absurd in the least, Darcy said quietly. I love Miss Elizabeth and have hopes of winning her hand, and I will not be dissuaded by the foolish behaviour of her very young sister. Bingley grinned at these words. So perhaps, if we are fortunate, we will be brothers some day. Yes, Darcy replied, and for a moment there was such hope, such longing on the man's face that Bingley was taken aback. Darcy, for all that he was a close friend, rarely showed much emotion. If you do intend to go to Netherfield, the Master of Pemberley continued, his face now calm again, I would suggest that you do not bring your sisters with you. Miss Bennet was doubtless hurt by Miss Bingley's dismissal of their friendship, and the family is, of course, dealing with a serious problem. The last thing they need is your sisters treating them disrespectfully and engaging in harmful gossip. An excellent point, Bingley agreed, his jaw clenched. Do I have your permission to tell my sisters that you confided in me about Miss Bennet's time in town a few months ago? Yes, certainly. Thank you. I will send a letter to Darcy House once I have made plans. Will you keep me informed of your progress regarding Miss Lydia? I will most certainly keep you informed, I promise. The Road to Hertfordshire, an hour later. The cushions of the hired carriage were clean and in good repair, and the carriage itself well sprung. Elizabeth swayed as they passed over a bump in the road, her pensive gaze not moving from the window. The fields and hedgerows outside were lush and green, fields of ripening wheat rippling in the sunlight, and flowers dotting colour across the pastures. Sheep trotted up to the fence to watch the carriage roll past, and contented cows chewed their cuds as they gazed at nothing in particular. Elizabeth's heart sat ill at ease, and yet not as heavy as it could have. Even as she could scarcely comprehend the ruin Lydia had brought on them all, her mind kept circling back to the compassion on Mr. Darcy's face as he assured her of his continuing admiration and affection. She did not think, really, that there would be anything he could do to save them from utter ruin, but it gratified her to know that he even would try. If he was earnest that his respect and love would not abate due to the idiocy of her youngest sister, oh, her ill-fated sisters, poor Jane left alone to deal with their mother's vapours, with Mary's withdrawn uncertainty, with Kitty's confusion and whining— at least their father was blessedly in London, searching for his wayward youngest and the scallywag who had run off with her. Elizabeth could not imagine that his presence at home would help matters. But it was not fair that unfortunate Jane should have to handle the entire remaining family members alone, 
and Elizabeth silently urged the horses and carriage faster that she might return the sooner to her home. How are you doing, Elizabeth? Mrs. Gardner suddenly asked. Elizabeth looked up to see both her aunt and uncle gazing gravely at her, and she managed a shaky smile. I'm incredibly upset about Lydia's situation, of course, but I find myself somewhat hopeful as well, as Mr. Darcy has promised to travel to London and help find Lydia and Mr. Wickham. Her older relatives exchanged quick glances, and then her aunt said, My dear Elizabeth, it is obvious to us that you and Mr. Darcy are far better acquainted than we realised. Elizabeth felt herself blushing furiously and lowered her gaze onto her ungloved hands. I... Yes, well, the truth is that when I was visiting Charlotte Collins in Kent a few months ago, Mr. Darcy... Um... He made an offer of marriage to me. Mrs. Gardner gasped loudly, and even her husband choked in surprise, which provoked their niece to look up, embarrassment written large on her face. I refused him, of course. I was angry about his treatment of Mr. Wickham and his role in separating Jane from Mr. Bingley. I am still unhappy about the latter. But regarding the former, well, Mr. Wickham is a rascal and a villain for all his fine speeches and pretty ways. He was paid £3,000 to give up all rights to the Kimpton living, the one that the elder Mr. Darcy set aside for Wickham. £3,000! Mrs. Gardner exclaimed. A princely sum! Yes, and there was an additional £1,000 from Mr. Darcy's father's will, so £4,000, and then Wickham went away and spent it all foolishly. He later returned and demanded the living when it fell vacant. Given Wickham's dissolute character, Mr. Darcy had every right and reason and indeed responsibility to refuse him. He would be more of a wolf than a shepherd for the people of Kimpton. And then Wickham slandered Mr. Darcy to everyone he met, the elder lady said, shaking her head. I had no idea, my dear. Indeed, I thought Wickham an excellent young man. As did I, of course. I championed him and spent time with him, and even wondered whether I was in love with him, and it turned out... Oh, I am so angry at myself. I ought to have told someone of Wickham's nature when I returned from Kent, but I was afraid of saying too much. I imagined that since he was leaving the district there was no reason, especially as few would believe me. He really is tremendously charming. She trailed away and found herself crying again from sorrow and anger at herself, Lydia and Wickham, and anxiety about the future. It seemed impossible that Mr. Darcy, nephew of an earl, would make a second offer to a woman whose family was plunged into a most hideous scandal. But when she remembered the look in Mr. Darcy's eyes and the gentleness of his expression, well, she could only wait and pray, and hope. Chapter 3. Georgiana's Private Sitting Room. Pemberley. Spending time in Georgiana's sitting room was a little like being inside a blooming rose. Pink striped wallpaper with pink rosettes on white, roses painted on the porcelain washbasin and pitcher, pink frilly cushions on the elegant chairs and love seat, pink roses in a cut crystal vase, and semi-sheer pink curtains edged with white lace, half drawn over the windows to tint the light filtering through them. The fireplace sat empty and swept clean and cold. Beside it sat the lady of the room and her brother. Darcy held Georgiana's slender right hand between both of his own, his eyes filled with worry as his gaze rested on her face. Her eyes were bright with tears, and even as he watched, they spilled over to run down her rather pale cheeks. Poor Miss Bennet, and poor Miss Lydia, Georgiana said, and quickly wiped her face with the handkerchief in her left hand. Of course you must go and help. I feel badly about leaving you here, my dear, but... I have Mrs. Ansley, and she is wonderful and I'm very fond of Mrs. Reynolds and my maid, and, well, I always feel comfortable here at Pemberley, and the Bennets desperately need your assistance. They do, Darcy agreed, and could not help but smile adoringly at his sister.
She was a kind soul, Georgiana, so eager to give up her own desire for his company in order to assist a woman who was little more than a stranger. And this time, Georgiana said, and suddenly her blue eyes were hard and determined. Deal with Mr. Wickham as he deserves, brother. Darcy, thinking of George Wickham's licentiousness and his debts and his slander and his attempt to run away with Georgiana and his success at running off with Miss Lydia Bennet, felt his jaw set and his hands tighten. I will, my dear, I assure you. Music Room, Pemberley, Noon, Saturday, 8th August, 1812. The Pemberley Music Room was beautiful, with floor-to-ceiling windows to let in an abundance of light, pale blue walls, simple white wainscoting and fluting, and subdued off-white cushions arranged tidily on the blue upholstered chairs and settee. It was a room that might well have been designed for the young performer now seated behind the elegant pianoforte, who was looking fresh and lovely in an uncomplicated pink muslin gown. Miss Caroline Bingley and Mrs. Louisa Hurst, in contrast, were as out of place as a pair of peacocks in this delicate setting. The feathers on Mrs. Hurst's bonnet bobbed with every movement, and the vivid saffron satin shone incongruously. Miles of lace lined Miss Bingley's silk morning dress, and her hair was pinned with enamel pins a trifle too fancy for a leisurely day in a country manner. Sunbeams slanted in through the windows, illuminating the room like spotlights. Dust motes and music notes danced through the air as Georgiana performed a very difficult piece with flawless skill. Nearby, her companion Mrs. Ansley had laid aside her habitual knitting and now listened with an approving smile. Bingley himself maintained an attentive expression, but he allowed his mind to wander freely. Unusually heavy thoughts occupied him while a low, simmering anger smouldered in his breast. His sisters and Darcy had willfully deceived him by concealing the angelic Jane Bennet's visit and very presence in London from him, and he found himself riding the waves of hot, incredulous exasperation. He wanted to be enraged that the three of them had dared to direct his life to their own pleasing, but he was an honest man and was forced to admit that in this they were merely following their usual course. Darcy, clever and some years older than himself, with a great deal of experience in managing both an estate and the intricacies of the hauteur, had long been in the habit of guiding Bingley. Thus far, Bingley had been happy with the other man's directions and interference in his affairs, while in this case he was furious with his friend, it was not entirely fair to blame Darcy. Bingley was at least certain that Darcy's actions had been genuinely based on their friendship. Jane Bennet was a quiet soul, and Darcy had, as he admitted, misread the situation. Bingley's sisters had far more ignoble reasons for their efforts to separate their brother from Miss Bennet of Longbourn. The Bingley family, while respectable, had won its fortune in trade, and both Caroline and Louisa were determined to rise higher into society by marrying landed gentlemen, and they were equally resolved that their only brother would marry a woman with excellent connections. Jane Bennet, with her lack of fortune and relations in trade, would not help them in their ambitions, and thus they had sought to cast her aside as one would throw away a rag. It made him want to grind his teeth in frustration and, yes, anger that they would treat Miss Bennet so poorly. He wanted to yell at them for their cruelty to the lady he loved, not to mention their own indifference to his personal happiness. Not that he would do so, however. He was not by nature a pugnacious or strong-willed man. He hated fusses and bothers and tantrums and vapours of any type, and he would assiduously avoid them. Caroline was especially well used to getting her way, knowing that she could easily overcome her milder-mannered older brother with merely the threat of hysterics. Though everything within Bingley longed to rush at once to Netherfield and call upon the Bennets to discover whether the handsome Jane still loved him as he loved her, 
he knew that both of his sisters would be extremely vocal in their disapproval of this plan. Even with all of his desire to see Miss Bennet again, he was not sure he could bring himself to weather the resulting emotional storm if he declared his intentions. His sisters would yell and scream and argue and cry, and his heart quailed within him at the thought. That was beautiful, Caroline exclaimed, and Bingley clapped along with his sisters as he realized that the musical performance had come to an end. Was she not marvelous, Charles? Louisa said, turning a penetrating look on her brother. Bingley was a trifle bewildered at the ferocity of Mrs. Hurst's glare, but he nodded and said, Indeed, Miss Darcy, you are most accomplished on the pianoforte. Thank you, Miss Darcy said, blushing at so much praise, and Mrs. Ansley said, Indeed, that was a charming performance, but I believe it is time for your French lesson in a few minutes. Georgiana glanced at the clock on the mantel. Oh, you are entirely correct. I will see you at dinner. Bingley rose to his feet and bowed a little. Miss Darcy curtsied in return and hurried out of the room with her companion at her heels. Bingley sighed and looked outside. The weather was fine, and while he preferred a companion when he was riding, he would prefer to go out alone on his gelding as opposed to spending the next few hours indoors with his sisters as his companions. I think I will go for a ride, he announced. The two sisters exchanged looks, and Caroline said, Do wait a few minutes, Charles. We wish to speak to you. Charles looked down at them and frowned. What about? Again the ladies glanced at one another, and then Caroline leaned forward and said, As regrettable as it is that Mr. Darcy was forced to go to London on business, this is a fine opportunity for you, do you not think? An opportunity for what? Why, to court Miss Darcy, of course, Caroline replied brightly. Elizabeth's Bedchamber, Longbourn, seven o'clock in the evening. Saturday, 8th August, 1812. The last rays of the setting sun were warm on Elizabeth's back where she sat on the window seat in her own room. Part of her heart was at ease, soothed by the familiarity of being home with her own bed and her own knick-knacks and the book on the side table, comfortable like wearing her old favourite dresses. Yet sorrow and anxiety sat within her, sharp, like a knife. She still reeled at the staggering depths of Lydia's foolishness and the consequences wrought upon all the Bennet. It felt strangely incongruous to sit here in this room, so dear and familiar, everything looking precisely as it always had, when in truth so much had changed, and for the worse. You wished to see Lydia's letter to Mrs. Forster, did you not? Jane asked, digging around in her reticule. I did, Elizabeth agreed, reaching out her hand to take the letter, whereupon she spread it open so that the sunlight fell upon the written words. My dear Harriet, you will laugh when you know where I am gone, and I cannot help laughing myself at your surprise tomorrow morning as soon as I am missed. I am going to Gretna Green, and if you cannot guess with who, I will think you a simpleton, for there is but one man in the world I love, and he is an angel. I should never be happy without him, so think it no harm to be off. You need not send them word at Longbourn of my going if you do not like it, for it will make the surprise the greater when I write to them and sign my name Lydia Wickham. What a good joke it will be. I can hardly write for laughing. Pray make my excuses to Pratt for not keeping my engagement and dancing with him tonight. Tell him I hope he will excuse me when he knows all, and tell him I will dance with him at the next ball we meet with great pleasure. I shall send for my clothes when I get to Longbourn, but I wish you would tell Sally to mend a great slit in my worked muslin gown before they are all packed up. Goodbye. Give my love to Colonel Forster. I hope you will drink to our good journey. Your affectionate friend, Lydia Bennet. Elizabeth groaned as she folded up the letter. Poor Lydia. She truly thought Wickham would marry her. And perhaps he will, Jane suggested tentatively. Elizabeth sighed and shook her head. You know as well as I do that Wickham wishes to marry a woman of substance and we are poor. 
I can only hope and pray that Mr. Darcy will find a solution.